Let's stand and remain standing. Uh, I want to bring a young man to this pulpit that we're all very proud of. I hear people say this sometimes. Why don't we see any miracles in the church? Now, I believe in miracles. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The same Jesus that walked the shores of Galilee is in this room. In spirit, he's in you. You're the body of Christ. But he's still in the miracle working business. And I've seen many, many miracles. And we recently celebrated with Sister Michelle as God healed her of a chronic case of lupus. Gone. Doctor confirmed. There's nothing God can't do. But may I remind you, the greatest miracle is the person you look at in the mirror in the morning. Standing before you, the miracle is in you. And the young man that's coming to preach the word of God is an absolute miracle. When you start talking about what God can do in transforming a life, if you'd have known him a few years ago, you wouldn't even believe it's the same young man. Bound by chains of darkness, God set him free, changed his life radically and dramatically, and has blessed him with a great ministry. And we're happy to have him home today. And I want you to welcome to this pulpit Brother Ethan Logston, come preach to us today, Brother Ethan. We love you. Let's give that to the Lord real quick. Let's give thanks to the Lord. Has he been good to you? Has he been good to your family? I can concur with the statements Pastor Wheeler made. He's the same God. I was talking with somebody not too long ago, and they said something so simple yet so profound. And often I, I used to come into services Sunday after su Sunday wondering, is this going to be the service he moves? Sometimes we do that. We, we come in thinking that maybe this will be my Sunday. M maybe, maybe this Sunday he'll decide to move. Maybe this Sunday he'll decide to bless. And I was talking with somebody. I said, do you think the Lord's going to move? And they said, well, he stays the same no matter what. So it's up to us whether or not we want him to move. Can I get one or two witnesses? He stays the same. If we want a move of God, we'll have a move of God. If we want a word from the Lord, we'll have a word from the Lord. He's the same God. I'm honored to be here. I felt his presence here this morning. I feel his presence here even now. I believe the Lord wants to do something in this place. I'm honored to be here. I'm honored to be here with Pastor Wheeler and my home church. It's always an honor to come back here and, and just be able to share the gospel and preach the good news. Amen. Let's go to Matthew chapter 19. I want to give honor to my wife as well. There's no way I would be able to do what I do without her. I thank God every day that I have a godly wife. Amen. Matthew chapter 19, starting in verse 16 to verse 24, I will read quick. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments, he saith unto him, which, Jesus said, thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man saith unto him, all these things have I kept from my youth up, what lack I yet? Jesus said unto him, if thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. I want to preach from this strange subject. Don't leave before the sermon's over. Don't leave 
before the sermon's over. Would you put your Bibles down? Would you lift your hands? Would you lift your voice? If you believe God wants to do something in the Holy Ghost, Lord, we love you. Lord, we came to hear a word from you, God. Now anoint these lips of clay. Take my mind. Do what you want to do in this place. Let me speak with clarity. Let me speak with anointing. Let me speak with boldness, with passion, and with power. Lord, anoint the congregation to respond and to hear what thus saith the Lord. And we're going to be careful to give you the glory, to give you the honor, and to give you the thanks. Would you clap your hands to the Lord if you believe him? And you may be seated. I've attained a fresh appreciation for each and every encounter that we find in Scripture concerning Jesus. I rarely take time to consider the privilege we've been given, the Gospels, three synoptic, four in total, each possessing a different personality and excavating stories with diverse outlooks and details. It was said of old at the testimony of two or three witnesses let it be established, which is why there are more than two to three Gospels that serve as confirmation to the old law. The ministry of Jesus is established at the witness of the Gospels concerning His message and His calling. And it is truly an honor to be a part of this latter generation clinging on to what the patriarchs, prophets, and kings of old longed for. Peter told us that this salvation we have been so freely given is what the prophets have inquired about and searched diligently for, prophesying that this grace, the grace unto salvation, should come to us. Now, I'm not diminishing the ministry of our biblical elders by any means, and I would be a fool if I chose to do so, but I can assure you, Moses, though he's seen the glory of God like no other, Elijah, though he's seen fire fall from heaven, Heaven. David, though he seen the ark firsthand and led the nation of God's chosen people, they would count it an honor to have laid the foundation of what we have now. Moses might have seen the glory, but this latter house has received a glory like no other. Elijah might have seen fire fall, but that's nothing like the cloven tongues that fell in the upper room. David might have seen the ark and he might have led the people, but the church be held the wonder of his glory as Jesus led us to salvation. Friends, we've got the real thing. The stories of old are our foundation, but we better never take for granted what we have now. We've got something better. We've got something greater. We've got something stronger. We've got the name of Jesus. We've got... Is there a witness in this place? We've got spirit baptism. We've got salvation. We've got grace and mercy like never before. Is anybody thankful to be alive during the age of the church? I say that to exemplify my appreciation for Jesus and his ministry. The absolute honor of having the life in times of Christ condensed into a plausible and tangible form whereby we are able to live through His ministry yet again. Because the Word of God is quick. The Greek, zao, which means to live or to be alive. So just because the parchments of papyrus are now printed on sheets of paper bound with leather and a table of contents, it is nonetheless still alive. Aren't you thankful that it's not just mere words on a page, but the breath of God will still whisper the inspiration and become the hammer that breaks the bedrock of Scripture, chiseling out a word from the Lord. Why? Because it's alive. It is breathing. It is moving. In the book of Jonah, it says the word of the Lord came to Jonah. But if you keep reading, it says that Jonah arose to flee from the presence of the Lord. And I got to thinking, the, the, the Scripture didn't say anything about His presence. It only mentioned His Word. Now, I don't know if Jonah was intentionally running away from the presence of the Lord, but what we do know is that he was running from the Word of the Lord. 
That means if we choose to disobey, ignore, or sidestep the Word of God, then we're choosing to run from the presence of God. Disobedience of His Word will ultimately lead to the forfeiture of His presence. Disobedience turns a glory-filled nation into an Ichabod. Departure from His Word will lead to the departure of His glory. If you watch a movement that backs away from this Word, I'll show you a God who backs away from their movement. You show me a preacher who backs away from this word and I'll show you a God who backs away from that preacher. Where the word of the Lord is, there is his presence. And where the presence of the Lord is, there is his word. Do you have Bible for that? I sure do. John 1 and 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Every time, every time you feel his word in a room, I can assure you, his presence will bear witness. When Jesus is approached by someone, you can almost feel the atmosphere of the text. There's a touch of anticipation waiting for the interaction between divinity and humanity. I often wonder if angels hang on the balcony wondering and waiting, what is God going to do for his people in a Sunday service? Listening, who's going to receive a prophecy? Is anybody going to be healed? I often wonder if we come into service truly thinking we're going to meet the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I wonder if every Sunday we truly realize we're meeting God Almighty, the one who was, who is, and is to come, the one that spoke the word and light was formed. I can almost watch the bystanders as they cling on to every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, knowing that just one word can change everything. That's why people were flocking to him. They were pressing through the crowd in hopes of grasping the hem of his garment. They were breaking through roofs and lowering people on stretchers. They were calling themselves dogs and saying things like, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table because they knew as well as we do just one word from the mouth of God can change everything. Just one word can bring us hope. Just one word can bring us healing. It can bring us deliverance. It can bring us mercy. That's why Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Real revelation is knowing that there's no place, there's no person, and there's no substance that can replace the voice of God. One word formed light. One word stopped the storm. One word healed the blind. One word restored the sinner. And one word raised the dead. Because there's power in the word of our God. There's a sermon I wrote not too long ago when it was inspired by the Song of Solomon, chapter 3. In this vivid account, we follow the happenings of a maiden who was in pursuit of something specific. And verse 1 begins with the viewpoint of this maiden, and it reads, By night on my bed I sought him whom my soul loveth. I sought him, but I found him not. I will rise now and go about the city in the streets, and in the broad ways I will seek him whom my soul loveth. I sought him, but I found him not. The watchmen that go about the city found me, to whom I said, saw ye him, whom my soul loveth. It was but a little that I passed from them, but I found him, whom my soul loveth. And I titled that message, not in the house, not in the streets, but near to the watchmen. This young maiden knew that there was something missing. Not only did she know something was missing, but whatever it was, that feeling of departure was strong enough to wake her up. There was no mention of a disruption. There was no mention of a nearby disturbance. But it seems to me that the text says the absence of the bridegroom alone was enough to wake her up. And I would to God that any time the bride feels absent from the bridegroom's presence, that alone would be enough to shake us. We don't need someone to push us and prod us into a place of sacrifice. But the desire to feel his presence alone should be enough to move us. The the distance of his voice and his presence should stir us. The maiden connected the desire 
was something that was missing from her soul. It, it wasn't material. It wasn't superficial. And it wasn't mediocre. But the maiden said it was something that her soul longed for. It was something that she sought on a deeper level. She knew that something abstract, something metaphysical, something that pushed past the surface level was missing. So she began to search her house, but to no avail. And she then does what some of us in this room might be familiar with. She says to herself, since I can't find what I'm looking for in my house, I'll go find what I'm looking for in the world. I'll run to the city. I'll go about the highways and the byways. I'll see if it's in the bars. I'll try to find it on a street corner. I'll go looking in the world. But the Bible says she sought and never found. Is there a witness in this place that can help me testify? You won't find it in a club. You won't find it in a bottle. And you won't find it in the streets. But the maiden said there was a watchman who found me. There was a man of God who came to where I was. There was a preacher who preached to me. There there was a prophet who spoke to me. There was somebody who knew what I was looking for. And they weren't afraid to show up where I was. They weren't afraid to pick me up, clean me off, and set me on my way. Come on, is anybody thankful for the watchman? Is anybody thankful for a pastor? Is anybody thankful for a preacher who didn't hold back, who didn't water it down, and who didn't ride the line? But a preacher who preached it like it was. Is anybody thankful for a prophet who didn't hold back? They weren't afraid to call you, wake you up in the middle of the night saying this is what the Lord told me, sending chills up and down your spine because the Spirit bore witness to their words. I'm thankful for the watchman. I'm thankful for a pastor. I wouldn't be here had it not been for true men and women of God. I'm thankful for a real, bona fide, God-sent preacher. Ah. It's okay. Not some pulpiteer with pomp and prestige that has no power and has no altar. I'm talking about a real preacher who says, I'm not leaving this room until I have an Isaiah counter. I'm not leaving until an angel grabs a live coal from off the altar in heaven and places it on my tongue. Because any preacher worth his salt won't preach what he finds on his altar, but he'll preach what was given to him from heaven's altar. Real men and women of God are a dying breed. It's rare to find one that isn't riddled with the infectious spirit of entitlement. It's rare to find a preacher who weeps in the pulpit under the glory of God because there was something placed in them the very day they were spiritually born and they were called to reach for souls that hang in the balance of eternity. It's rare to find a man or woman of God that brings such a presence of conviction that you can hardly be around them without searching your own spirit because they've made themselves a living sacrifice they say when elder Kilgore would step into the pulpit he wouldn't even say a word but people would begin to weep under the spirit because conviction would blanket the entire room not a single word spoken just a witness of the Holy Ghost that confirmed his ministry real men and women of God are rare that's why I'm thankful for the ones I know. I'm thankful for this pastor who gets up before you every Sunday because had it not been for his voice, I would have lost my way. I'm thankful for a mother and a father who have prayed for me and wept over my soul. I'm thankful for a godly wife who helps me fight hell and everything they throw at me. I'm thankful for the ministry. I'm thankful for the watchman. Are you thankful for the watchman? Are you thankful for a pastor? Uh. Come on, are you thankful for a pastor who doesn't water it down, but says, I'm going to preach it straight. I don't care what culture says. I don't care what the world says, but I'm out to save your soul. I feel my help in here. Come on, are you thankful for this man of God that gets up and preaches what thus saith the Lord? The maiden from the Song of Solomon did something that night. It says she grabbed him 
and would not let him go. She got a hold of the things of God and she didn't let them get away from her. I promise I'm going somewhere. She didn't let anyone deter her. She didn't let anyone shake her. She said, I got you, and I'm not letting you go until I bring you back to my house. Because once you're in this thing, friend, you're in this thing. You buy this truth, and you sell it not. You put your hand to the plow, and you don't look back. You put one foot in front of the other, and you go from glory to glory. You go from strength to strength, and from the wilderness into the promise. We don't need any more compromising, lukewarm, uncommitted Christians. We need steadfast, straight-laced, God-fearing, good-spirited, righteous, living saints. We need men and women of God with a backbone that when a preacher gets up behind this pulpit and tells them what thus saith the Lord, they don't get a bitter spirit and tell the pastor, I'm going to leave. But they say, I'm going to stay because you've got a love for my soul. And I know you're looking out for my best interest. And you're a watchman on the wall that says, I see a wolf in culture that you don't see. And I see a wolf in the field that you don't see. A man of God. Women of God, dying breeds. There are accounts of people who left the faith and walked away from Jesus because once they heard him teach, they decided that it was too difficult to follow him. A verse from John 6 reads, From that time, many of his disciples, not followers, disciples, went back and walked no more with him. These were not strangers. These were not the occasional bystanders, but these were people who followed Jesus regularly. They walked with him. They learned from him. The writer even feels led to tell us that he considered them disciples. One of the more difficult passages I find is Matthew 10, 34-39. Jesus said, think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foe shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Parabolic, no. That's literal. Jesus said, if you place anything above your love for me, you're not worthy of me. That's Bible. Amen. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Think not of peace. But, but Jesus, I thought you were supposed to be the prince of peace. Ah, uh, he is, but that's the law of the kingdom. So where his reign is, there is peace. But once you get somebody that's following Jesus and sold out to the Lord, he will give them peace. But once they go to a household that is in opposition to the kingdom, he draws a sword. Hmm. He said in Matthew 5 and 48, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which in heaven is perfect. Though this word perfect means complete, it carries the same connotation. A Christian cannot live in sinless perfection, but we are required, required to strive as close to it as we can. We're not called to ride the line, we're called to be a Christian. We will slip and make mistakes, there's no doubt about it. But should we abide in sin, that grace may abound, God forbid. Grace is supposed to be a safety net, not a license to sin. Grace is supposed to aid you in your completion, not aid you in your sin. Strive to be sinless, but let grace and mercy guide you. In Matthew 6, 24, Jesus said, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one, hate, Hate, not dislike, not put to the side. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon or mammonos from Aramaic root means anything earthly. 
Without sugarcoating it, Jesus was saying, if you serve anything on this earth besides him, you hate him. There's no way around it. You can have the best intentions. You can have the best aspirations. But the word division, division, literally means to have two visions. It's when you know God has a vision for this. But I would rather do this. Division. Where there is no vision, the people perish. I just, can I flow in the Holy Ghost? So when this pastor casts a vision and says, this is what I want to do. This is what I feel the Lord has told me to do. Hmm. Any other vision that is served against that is die vision because there's two visions. And they're saying, I'm not going to serve the vision of this pastor. Hmm. Now see, it, aha. See, it, it might not be a bad thing either. Because Elisha was commanded to follow Elijah. And God said, I'm going to do what you want me to do in your life. Don't worry. But it's not your vision yet. I've called you to serve your man of God's vision. See, Elisha, your vision's not wrong. I will use you. I will use you to be a great prophet. Don't get me wrong. Ah. But Elisha, be careful not to slip into division because you're not following the man of God's vision. Uh, it's, it's not a wrong thing. Elisha, you can have aspirations to be the best prophet in all the nation of Israel. That's not a wrong. God will call you to do so. But right now in this season, he said, submit to your man of God. Submit to that vision. Because I set up and I remove kings. I hold the heart of the king in the hand and turneth it whithersoever way I will. It's the Lord's doing. The Lord appoints and the Lord anoints. So when you serve something else, you serve another vision to which Jesus said, if you do this, you despise him. And most would think that they don't, but unfortunately, Jesus says, you do. Don't leave before the sermon's over. <laughs> don't walk out just yet. I promise I'm going somewhere. He also told those who follow him not to worry about your life what you will eat or drink, nor about your body or, or what you will wear. But instead, he says, seek ye first. That's right, Brother Fred. That's right. Seek ye first. You guys said it earlier. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. No, that's figurative, right? No, no it's not. Jesus was quite literally saying, don't worry about if you're going to live or die. Don't worry about if you're going to eat or not. Worry about me and my kingdom and everything else will fall into place. We've got too many people who are anxious about the material. They're worried about job security. They're worried about their health, their finances, their grocery bill. But I'm here to preach the same thing Jesus did. Seek me first and I'll take care of the rest. But don't look at the bills. Don't look at the economy. Don't look at the sickness or the storm or the marriage. Look at Jesus. Seek after Jesus. Walk after Jesus because he promised everything will work together. You've just got to find his purpose. You've got to serve his vision. You've got to seek his righteousness. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said more people are going to hell than they are heaven. Amen. More people are going to hell than they are heaven. I know televangelists and prosperity movements might have taught you different, but Jesus says they're wrong. Could you give me Isaiah 5 and 14? This is around the time of a prophet. Therefore, hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure. Hmm. So, Friends, if that means hell was growing back then, it is undoubtedly growing as I speak. If wickedness will wax worse and worse, like the Bible says, then hell will grow larger and larger. Jesus says, if I go, I'm going somewhere, trust me. Jesus said, if the world hates me, they'll hate you too. The world should not support your belief system. And if they do, I've got some questions. That doesn't mean we should be hateful or overly negative or garner a bad reputation. I'm just saying, if your theology is lined up with Scripture and somebody were to ask you publicly what your stance was on a few things, I can promise they won't be happy. 
people always accuse Christians of not acting like Jesus. And I agree up to a certain point. We are, we are called to love people no matter who they are. I agree. The anointing doesn't give us a pass to be bullies or, or to use the pulpit for our own kingdoms. We know this is true. But it honestly makes me wonder when people say, you need to act more like Jesus, really. Because they killed him for what he said. They killed him for what he was teaching. The things that he was saying not only got him in trouble with the church, but it got him in trouble with the world. So when Jesus said, take up your cross, yeah, he was telling us that we need to deny the flesh, but I'm about to bust up someone's theology. You might be able to carry the cross and maybe even climb onto it, but you can't finish it. You can't crucify yourself. You're going to have to let people do it for you. Uh, if you truly walk and follow after Jesus, you won't have to crucify yourself. People will. Oh, yeah, they will mock you. They will ridicule you. They will backstab you. They will tell you you have no ministry. You have no anointing. You have no place among us. I've always said this, and I will live by this statement until the day I die. The mark of Christianity is suffering, and the mark of ministry is betrayal. So, so let's just wrap up what Jesus said. Jesus, one, didn't come to bring peace to people who aren't living for him. If you serve something else, then you hate him and despise him. There's no way around it. If you do decide to follow him, don't worry about if you'll live or not. Don't worry about what you'll eat or not. Don't, don't worry about what you'll wear. And while you're at it, remember, hell is growing. And heaven isn't easy to get into. Because Jesus said, more people will go to hell than they will heaven. Also, if you live for God, don't expect a smooth ride. It won't be easy because Jesus never said it would be easy. People will hate you. They will mock you. They'll hurt you. And they'll say things that cut you deep. And you need to be ready to pick up your cross. The cross was a symbol of death. And lastly, fellowship and suffering is a requirement if you truly want to know Jesus. And if you don't suffer, then you will never truly know God. So who wants to be a Christian? Come on, who wants to be a Christian? <laughs> That's what I expected. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful. Mm. And Jesus said unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Yeah, people will hate you. It won't be easy. No one ever said it would be. You will suffer in ways you can't possibly comprehend, but don't leave just yet. D don't walk away just yet. There's a reason I spent so much time talking about the Word of God. There's a reason I spent so much time talking about the maiden who knew that she had to find what her soul was missing. Everything I've talked about has led up to this very moment. Don't leave before the sermon's over. I know I've, I've seemed scattered. I've, I've seemed to be preaching all over the place. But don't leave. There's a reason. Someone needs to know that just one word. Someone needs to know that it doesn't take a season. It doesn't take a mountain of faith. It doesn't take some extravagant plan or detour. All it takes is a word from God. I feel led in the Spirit to talk to somebody directly. What God is doing right now in your life, it's unbearable. There's an immense weight and pressure that's been placed on you and you don't know what to do. God impressed on my spirit earlier this week that somebody was getting ready to give up. Somebody was getting ready to walk out. Somebody was getting ready to leave. Let's turn back to Matthew 19. We'll start in verse 24, I promise. Don't leave. And again, I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, who then can be saved? And before we go to the next verse, we need to understand something. Jesus is still in the same spot. 
Jesus hasn't left, he hasn't moved, and he hasn't traveled on. He is still in the same spot where the rich young man heard the teachings of Jesus and heard what it was going to be like to be a Christian and walked away. He hasn't left. Now give me verse 26. Ha <laughs> ha. But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, with men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. I'm here to tell somebody, don't leave before the sermon's over. Don't leave before you hear it all. Don't walk out before it's finished. God dropped a word in my spirit a few days ago, and somebody needs to hear this. Don't close the book because I'm still holding the pen. He hasn't finished writing. He's not done with your story. I don't care how impossible it looks. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what the doctor said. I came with a word in my spirit. Don't leave before the sermon sermon's over. Don't walk out on God. Don't walk out on church. Musicians can come. Last night I was praying with my brothers in here and I, I just felt something so deep. I texted my mom. I said, there's such a vein of the Holy Ghost in here tonight. And God started to speak to me and he said, I'm getting ready to do something in this place. Mm. Somebody's been ready to walk out, but God's about to do something in this church. Don't leave before the sermon's over. Don't walk out. Don't pack your bags. God's about to do something at 3406 Edgar Brown Drive. Uh, I, just, I, just, I feel it in my spirit. Don't leave just yet. Don't leave before the sermon's over. Don't check out because God's going to do something in this place in this last hour. Come on, is there anybody that believes God will give this church revival? Could we all stand? I'm done. I'm finished. I'm over. I've asked them to sing, same God. And sometimes we tend to forget that the same God who parted Red Seas, the same God who sent fire down, is the same God we meet with every Sunday. It's the same God that walked through that rough Judean climate, giving hard teachings that seem almost impossible to hear. And he's telling you that the life of a Christian won't be easy. It's not glamorous. It's not full of prestige by any means. And that young man walked out because the man of God said something that didn't quite sit well with him. And he said, I, I can't do it. I, there's no way I could possibly be a Christian. There's no way I could possibly be an apostolic. The way they live, the rules, they call them, there's no way. And people walk out before the sermon's over because Jesus, still standing in the same spot, said, with men, this is impossible. You can't live for God through flesh. But he said, with God, all things are possible. Uh, don't check out on God just yet. He's not done writing someone's story. He said, don't give up on me just yet. I'm still working something in the process. Job 23 said, behold, I go forward. And he is not there backward, but I do not perceive him on the left hand where he doth work, but I do not behold him. And he hideth himself on the right hand. There's one thing that stood out to me. Job said on the left hand where he doth work, but I do not behold him. Job said, though I'm standing in the midst of darkness, I can't see my future, and it's almost like I can't see my past. But one thing I do know is that you're still working. You're not over with my story. You're not finished. You're still the author. You're still the finisher. I want to invite you to the front if you believe what I'm saying. If you believe he's still the same God. If you believe he's not finished yet. Don't leave before the sermon's over. Don't check out on God before he's done. And as they sing, I wonder if you would just lift your hands and entertain the presence of God just for a moment.